Okay, well, here we are. We got the Bang Bush up against the three legged cat. And honestly, now that I look at it, I'm not so sure anymore if this is actually the game that I wanted to go into. Um, I don't think that's the three legged cat that we're talking about here. So I'm slightly confused uh, what game this is and what round this is. I am not gonna lie. I'm a little bit confused by all of the games that we currently have today, more so in the sense of, yeah, this is actually disbanding that is playing here right now, if I see that correctly. So we gotta adjust the overlay real quickly. This, these two groups with all of the, with all of these best of ones that we have, is a bit crazy. So yeah, team disbanding is playing here, and it's not the three-legged cat that seems to be the next round. It's a little bit confusing, as you can tell. There's like two groups. There's a lot of matches happening at the same time. Some of the groups are faster than others. And one group is in round four, one in round three. That the Masters class switched the tournament over a little bit today was quite confusing. And especially since this is still a solo production. I mean, I'm, again, doing the overlays, doing the observing and all of the other stuff myself, including, of course, the commentary. Sometimes this is getting a bit out of hand. But yeah, so we got this figured out. We got this banding on the left side. We got the bang bush in here. We focus today quite a bit on Granite Gaming, but we also want to have another look at the red team. We already highlighted them in the second qualifier. We're now in the third qualifier of the Masters Clash. Two teams are, of course, qualified for the playoffs already directly, and that is uh, the Hardos. They won qualifier number one, and it is Team Wa who won qualifier number two. And we'll find out tomorrow, after the group stage ended, in the bracket system, which team will secure the third qualifier and therefore a spot in the playoffs directly. Now as we're heading into this, we got Lunara and Lucio taken right from the get-go in Dragonshire for disbanding. On uh, the right side of the map, Lauba with Jojo and it's immediately again this multi-tank play with Johanna sitting on the side lane and then Diablo plus Hanzo. So not only does Bishops get his Hanzo but they also have this double tank. Now, there's a very good chance that we're going to see a little bit of a swap happening where Lauba goes into Diablo directly and then some Corona plays Johanna on the side lane. So that's the next thing that's uh, going to happen here. Bit of a focus on the support bands now from the blue team since they're obviously, they already have Lucio locked in, so they're trying to limit the pool of available heroes a little bit to Bang Bush. It's pretty tricky though to ban supports out properly. I mean, you got Anduin around, you got still. Uh, Brightwing has been banned, but you got uh, they got Kane, you got Anduin. Those two alone are already quite great here for potential picks, but it goes even uh, beyond that. Now we have Tigers banned. There's obviously a pretty heavy front line with Jojo. Yes, he got a blind, but still doesn't completely make up for this. We still need a main tank and also a side laner for disbanding. Raxa got eliminated, so you don't have any chance of going for a top lane Raxa and then run the King of Dragonshire there. Instead, we're gonna get a Leo. And we have Imperius. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Tracer Malfurion. All right, that got over a while. Tracer Malfurion together with the Hanzo from Bishops. And yeah, that's now Leo, Imperius, and what else are we getting? I mean, technically, you could even go into the triple front line right now. A little bit of additional range damage might not necessarily hurt, but with Lunara, you got that covered as long as you add another frontliner that also can dish out damage. But they need something that deals with Tracer. And there's Varian! Yes, there it is! The triple frontline! Varian against Tracer can get the taunt in. Very heavy frontline, but they also got to deal with Diablo and with Johanna, so that makes things a bit more tricky. Either way, we're heading into our game now. Disbanding against the Bang Bush. Disbanding against the Bangbush, everybody. On the left side, we have Lavacal on Imperius. Mimikyu on Varian. He's the one that has to deal with Tracer. Itrax on Lunara. Makdo on Leoric. And Rutek is playing Lucio. Whereas on the right side of the map, we now have the Bangbush with Henning on Malfurion. They came close last time, the qualifying. But they couldn't quite lock in the W. Team rah, proved to be a little bit too strong. Now we got Skok on Tracer, we got Bishops on Hanzo, and on top of that we have Swam Grotta with Johanna. As expected, they swap the heroes around. Lauba is playing Diablo. But yeah, here it is. So that's another one where Team Bang Bush can, of course, try and establish a good position in the group so that they can qualify for the second phase of this tournament of the qualifier and well they are already starting things off with a bit of a bang as they are trying to take a 
swipe at Varian. Nearly getting a kill too. Weren't quite able to lock that in, but yeah. It's a lot of CC obviously on the team. Slows from Lunara and from Leo. And then again, you have stuns with Imperius and with Varian. Up at the top. From Garota against Magdo. This is exactly the one that we expected here. So once again, if you're playing Johanna in a side lane position, what really makes her a suitable side laner is that she has with the Iron Skin a tool that helps her to escape. She has also some self-sustain, more so even if you go into the Laws of Hope as your level 1 talent. But even in this encounter, works for her. And she has the wave clear. Now she's not necessarily going to win the lane against a dedicated side laner, but all that she has to do is not lose it too hard. As long as you can hold your own there get the experience don't lose too many of the structures you're fine since later when we're heading into more team fight battles you have all of a sudden two tanks that you can play with and she's also a bit more free to go into falling sword if she really wants to so a lot of advantages to it very hit point heavy front but you always gotta encounter you always gotta account a bit for how okay how much wave clears my opponent have what exactly do they have on the side lane here too but we've seen of course that particular play quite a few times now already. Yeah, here comes the Swisher plays against Skork. Tracer, we've seen her a few times today. Some Grotta is helping out too. And only a single kill so far, but there's quite a bit of control on the shrines. Yeah, here comes the potential taunt, and there it is! Diablo gets taunted, and that's the end of Lauba. Second kill. Disbanding. Able to lock in a few kills and take it from there. The CC is definitely strong with them, and the level 7 on Malfurion has to help out with that a bit. But yeah, so far, so good. Once again, here comes Mimikyu, and Varian comes in with another taunt. In this case, though, there were too many minions around, the Tracer would have already taken a few shots from the towers. Double control this time for the blue team, but no real threat just yet. Now, let's not forget... Diablo, also with the souls that he's slowly getting, will increase his hit point pool. It's quite important too. And here we go. Top side, Swam Grotta. As you can see, he's doing fine so far. Obviously, he's going to need an assist every now and then. Personally, I'm really a big fan of having uh, Jojo on the side lane. Good kill against Tracer. Nice. Overwatch against Overwatch. If you can afford it, then it's pretty nice because the uh, later fights are going to be pretty sweet for you. But of course against Leo, she's not going to be able to do anything here in the sense that she's not going to win this lane. She's already taking damage on the structures as you would expect. That's why the red team has to every now and then rotate some on top side to put some pressure onto Leo. But again, her job isn't to win the lane. Her job is to have an impact in the later stages and simply not lose it too hard as explained earlier. That's pretty much all that you got to do there. Three kills to one as Imperius died, so they got their first counter kill. They're also going for Lunara again. The bomb doesn't connect though. And here comes the taunt. I think... Did he just taunt Diablo? I thought for a second he wanted to go for Tracer. They have a chance with the double control now of some Grotta to maybe even go for a Dragonite. I mean, not quite. In the mid lane, we got Diablo right now. So he's currently sitting there. Rotation is already happening. Three kills to one. And a slight... I mean, experience is fairly even. But yeah, they make another play for Lavacal. Or at least they're trying to. But the Dragonite has already been snuck in. Oh, and a bit of a kick straight in the butt of Lunara. Bambi got kicked around here. But so the first DK is in. Imperius is dying at the same time. So not only do they get the Dragonite, but they also get another kill. Three to two. And of course, now that they have the DK, you can play it slow if you want to. Seems like Dragonite has a bit of an animosity against Lunara. It's like one kick against her after another. So she gets literally kicked out of the bot lane <laughs> and is turning that into an advantage. Yeah, free lane transition. Very free lane transition right there. Here comes another play straight up for uh, Varian. He should... Uh, it's gonna get a bit icy, but he should be able to get away here. Unless... No, nah, I can't fully follow up on it. So Varian is still fine. Dragonite down at the bottom used the Dragon's Breath a little bit more to get damage on the structures. They were able to take a tower down. They dropped the gate. And they're even getting this one low, so not too shabby. So pretty good significant advantage on structures at least. Weren't able to take a fort down yet, but they definitely opened up some possibilities for later on in the game. There's still some camps up, and they're now taken. But besides that, we have of course now the Choke and Pollen in. 
flash of anger after the sovereign armor for Imperius. And they're even looking to potentially invade here, but there's level 10. They should be a bit careful. Yeah, the arrow comes in. I'm not sure what they were thinking there, but Lucio is dead, and that's the end of Lunara. Rule number one in Heroes of the Storm, if your <laughs> Bambi gets kicked around, the ragdoll gets just crushed over there. But rule number one has always been when your opponent has level 10 and you don't, get the fuck out of there. Don't engage. Obviously, they were kind of hoping to moving in, get a taunt and then a quick kill. But that was wishful thinking, as you could just see. And them jumping in a bit too deep meant they lost two heroes and quite a bit of the initiative that they were trying to build earlier. So, yeah. But either way, we have the Thornwood Vines now in. Nothing out of the ordinary, really. I mean, we got Warbringer now. We got the Angelic Armaments. Nothing crazy. Lunara went for the poke from a distance. So he's not repositioning here with a Leaping Strike. We still see them trying to take those Siege Giants. And they will definitely get those. It's kind of funny that Mimikyu is actually sitting here. Whereas everybody on the red team is on the left side. So now they figure that out too. Since the bot lane fort is getting pushed. But the siege giants have been taken. And are now starting to slowly damage the fort. Henning in trouble. Another arrow from Bishops. Bishops and his Hanzo is just crazy. That arrow was one of the easier ones of course. But they are getting three kills. They are going for kill number four. And they might even be able to follow it up with the fifth one against Varian. Who is already on the run and just trying to escape here. Situation still remains the same though while the fort down to the bottom right takes damage and the siege giants are chunking it down significantly this one has also been destroyed fairly easily we're now looking at level 13 eight kills to three big advantage for the bang bush as they take slowly but steadily full control of this game so yeah nicely done here by them but of course 27,000 damage for hanzo Bishops, he loves to play the hero. Every time he gets the chance, he goes for it. Interrupt the temp by Lavakal. And I gotta say, that is optimistic. In comes the Dragonite. There was no real denying that this would be a second objective for the Bang Bush. So yeah, Lunara, again, she's hopping around. This time it is, ooh, we got a poverty horse over there. Lavakal, look at that. The pleb horse in play gets kicked away once again. But they are going to get that fort regardless. At least they should. Can play it slow and just play around with the dragon's breath. Another arrow connects with three. And oh dear. Lunara is dead instantly. The arrow absolutely on point. Stunning out three targets. And the follow up was there too. Now they're dropping Mimikyu. Stun from Imperius. But there's no real damage that can be connected anymore. Varian is dead. It's 10 kills to 3. Level 14. And they don't even know where to go next. I mean, they're sitting topside in an attempt to maybe drop... <laughs> Spray game is on point. <laughs> Just playing around a little bit with... Uh, well, Lauber might die. I mean, what else is new, right? No, but he... Is he going to get away here? ha <laughs> No way. Okay, okay, okay. The maze to the face. And there it is, the kill. Still two levels ahead. Siege Giants got taken down at the bottom too. So, yeah. It is a wild one. It's a pretty important map for the Bang Bush again. This is one of those turns. This is a bit of a weird tournament just in general. Because you're now in a situation where you have multiple teams that could very well qualify for the main event here. We have in one group the team around Breeze, Wubi and uh, Smexy with Mark and Azerite. So we got those guys around and uh, Gravel Gaming. And then we got Bang Bush. But there's obviously a couple of other teams that on a good day could also come in and uh, take some wins and maybe even cause an upset. So it's a really interesting qualifier. Day number two should be kind of wild. Tracer gets attacked down here and it seems like... No, again! It's again Bishops with his Hanzo. Like this time he saves Tracer and they turn it into a double kill. Maybe even a triple. I mean, seriously. It looked like finally they had control of Tracer, they controlled the recall point and then just as they all group up to take her down, Bishop sees an opportunity, drops the arrow again, stuns them out and what looked like a potential Tracer kill turned into two dead heroes on the side of this banding. Ah, it is a little bit heartbreaking but oh boy. 
That was kind of crazy. So now they're not only going to steal those camps away, they're going for another fort. And once they eliminate that, it will be much, much harder to hold anything at the top lane together without the sustain of the fountain. 13 to 4 kills. They go into the bridge of death. Zero respect. Lurizio is down instantly. And now they can rotate towards the middle. <laughs> I mean, the wall is already open there. Can go for the keep right away or play around the bot lane of course the objective is up too and both of the tanks have now already moved over to take control diablo on his way in the middle this should be first game first keep of the game three levels ahead by now they can literally decide who takes it and diablo moving down with the rest of the team for just a moment they're also claiming another camp here and Leo is just half a second too late. Diablo already got the Dragonite and they have the camp at the bottom of the map. So now they're going to move down bot lane in an attempt to take the keep. Another arrow! Bishops connects it again. The ult at least chosen by Imperius, but he gets dropped either. Anyways, I don't think Bishops... Bishops has not missed an arrow. Lunara is dead. There's level 16 for disbanding, but well... They are still down to heroes, so this is likely going to be game. We have 16 kills to 4. The Dragonite is arriving. They got a camp. If they get more kills, then this is just lights out. Seems like Lucio is going to be the next victim. And he is dead too. They take the keep. They go for core. They're bang bush. They're banging a couple of heads together today. They really want to qualify now for the Masters Clash. The boys are putting all the effort in here. And at least on Dragonshire, within 12, 13 minutes, they're able to lock in the victory. 18 kills, 2-4. And that is going to be it one way or another. Make it 19, make it 20 kills, I guess. I suppose they're going to get Lulnara here, and indeed they do. And that is it. Victory for Bangbush against Disbanding on Dragonshire. He had the third qualifier for the Masters Clash. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Infernal Shrines, we got another map coming up. The third qualifier for the Masters Clash again today. It's all best of ones, all single maps that are played in the group stage of the third qualifier, the round robin. Now we have Bang Bush going up against the three-legged cat. That's actually the match that I thought earlier we would have. I was slightly confused with the with the teams. I was like, wait a second, that is, that is not that's not the cats. So yeah, but here we are. Bang Bush is doing well in their group. Obviously, all of the teams that do well in the group stage then move on to the second day of the qualifier, where they can then enter the bracket stage and potentially qualify for the event for the playoffs. Now we are in final shrines this time. We have Rega banned out and Hogger instantly taken care of. Johanna gets banned too. Keep your eyes on Hanzo. He murdered again on the last map. And whenever... I, this should already be a Hanzo pick right here for Bishops. They have a double pick now. Junkrat has been claimed by Drakia. That's also, of course, a fantastic one. Then at the same time, Bishops with his Hanzo is nasty. Absolutely nasty. Now, Blaze is up too. So, Blaze is a real powerful pick. And there he is. And there's Hanzo. So, exactly the double pick that we just talked about. Makes a whole lot of sense given the players that are involved here. The map that we're playing... So, a very expected rotation from Bang Bush. That made a lot of sense. The impact that Bishops has with his Hanzo is crazy. Then Blaze is always a fantastic pick. Probably the best side laner still at this moment. And then on Infernal Shrines, even get more value out of him with everything being focused onto those shrines directly. We still have a little bit of uh, focus on the AoE, also from the three legged cat. So they are going for Leo, another fantastic hero to play on Infernal Shrines and also good for the top lane. With Brightwing having the option to play at least a bit on the global side and jumping in to help out side lane, uh, any kind of isolated target that might push out later in the game. Could still go for also a birdie at some point. I mean, that's another question. Do you go into a mage when you're playing for the bang bush or do you just go for false dead? Are you trying to add some global pressure to all of this? Yes or no? We have Zeratul banned. Could also deal with Lauber a bit. We already saw a ban on Jojo, in this case from the red team. 
but over here you could of course decide that for example you're getting rid of Diablo if you're afraid of any kind of like wall stuns that could be happening here with Blaze. It's different ways how you could play it. I mean you could literally also go into an Anubarak and just try and dive but Diablo for the wall stuns is always neat. Lauber is also... <laughs> there's a Diablo ban. <laughs> I guess they agree. Lauber is also one of the few players that lately has started to play an ETC main tank a little bit again. And one of the maps where he did that was Infernal Shrines. So it's not necessarily the most popular pick. It's still something that you should keep in mind. Just because it is one of those that they can throw out every now and then. But we'll see what Lauber is going to go for. Mirrodin is of course also up and it's a favorite of his. But they're keeping it up to the last. Unless he really wants to go for a main tank blaze here. Now Lauba is one of the few players that actually experimented for quite some time with a main tank blaze. And normally he lets it slide and doesn't go for it. It became more popular after Blizzard made the uh, the, 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 the wind up on the jet propulsion a little bit uh, smaller. So now you can do that. The Hark on the side, that would be great. And if there is one map where you can play a main tank blaze, it is actually Infernal Shrine. So it could definitely be a thing for them. But here comes Sylvanas. Very late pick for my try on Sylvanas, but he still gets access to it. And Mel Ganis. And there's Mephisto. So yeah, so I'm going to likely going to give Blaze over to Lauber. And then we're going to get that main tank situation going there. Uh, but yeah, something that you will most likely see these days only on Infernal Shrines, at least on this level of play. Either way, Infernal Shrines is the map. And that gives us the three-legged cats up against Team Bangbush. Let's go. The Cats against Bangbush. We got Drak here on Junkrat. Captain Rex on Brightwing. Erath is playing Leoric. We got Johan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On Malganis and Maitri on Sylvanas. Whereas on the right side of the map, Team Bangbush. They're coming in with, ba with Henning on Stukov. Skok on Mephisto. So we get some mage action going. We have some Grotta on the Haka, Bishops and Hanzo. And yes, Lauber indeed on Blaze this time. Main tank Blaze, you don't see it all too often. Even in the days of HTC when Blaze got released, some of the teams experimented with him. Dignitas, for example, played him in like two or three games. And uh, uh, maps like Dragonshire. JPL and others, they didn't like it too much. They won a few games with it, but they always said, yeah, it doesn't really feel good. It's not one for us, so most teams drop that right away. But Lauber is one of the few players that every now and then Blue Moon is going to give you a blaze and main tank. That coordination here was a little bit off, but damn, that was clutch. My try could have been in a bit of trouble, so they're already going for early game aggression right now. Well, top side, we got Hirath against Swam Garota. We got that global play now, and of course. Question is also how Bishops is gonna play this out. Bishops and his Hanzo plays, they are pretty crazy. He went on level one here into the target practice right away. And of course we have with Skok a lot of AoE, which is especially annoying when you are playing in these shrine fights with stacked up players. Yeah, but the top, the 1v1 is still continuing between them. And over on the left side and the right side, we now have both of the teams going for the first Kazura camp, trying to get the goats in action. With the three camps available, the question is always at the beginning of the game, which team will lock in the third one? So that's your usual go-to. We got the reactive Ballista Spores, by the way, on level one for him. Blaze is in the middle of the map now. There's a lot of AoE, you get the bunker later. So there's quite a bit that you can play around with and also the slow that the oil spill alone is going to give you. Yeah, Lauba is making his way back down here together with the rest of them. And starting to take this out, but it has already been sniffed out by Johan. Uh, bit of a play here in the middle, by the way. So from Grotta is looking for the drag, connects it. And make sure that drag at least eats one of the tower shots. But the camp has been taken uh, by the rest of his team down at the bottom of the map, so good for them. And here we have it. A quick move into the mid lane again as they're looking for another drag. And there it is. Sylvanas might die. She should die, and she does die. Goes down. First blood in the game, the Bang Bush. Yep, off to a banging start here on Inferno Shrines. Right wing with a magic spit. And we have also the Lurker Strain here. Once again, they're even going for Leo now at the top, and I'm not sure if he can still ghost out there. Yes, he can. Eat some damage from bishops as he's starting uh, to connect a few more shots. There's two stacks on his level one by now. So, yeah, two stacks already in. 
needs of course a little bit more with all of this went into the explosive arrows on level four helps you quite a bit when you are playing around the objective depending on your positioning of course as well but talking about the objective the first try is now active and as usual that means that the players are going to try and get level seven first so we'll see those side laners make their play brightwing in this case as a global for the three-legged cat is taking off the, the role at the bottom of the map and as you would expect the haka is already helping out too yeah here comes the next engage this time they're going for johan Nice push out. Bishops, they're all low. They're all low here. Hereth in particular is going to be saved now. Drakir gets hit and barely gets out as Bishops is definitely starting to uh, bring the pain here. They're going for a kill and they take Malganis down. There's the second kill. Bishops comes in hit after hit and is able to lock in two kills together with the help of Stukov. That's three kills to zero now in total and a level seven talent that they can rock. Even Sylvanas at the bottom of ma the map finds herself in a bit of uh, a pickle. Svam Grota not able to solidify the kill, but still holds on to the lane. So that's the first objective easily taken by Team Bangbush and some very good players here from the red team. And they're taking that lead. So up at the top, Lauber has even been able to uh, protect the camp. Leo is now moving in to finally deal with that, but it helps them to take one of the towers down. As in the mid lane, the Punisher is now doing work, assisted by Stukov, who comes in with a lurking arm. On level 7, we now get the Dragon Hungers, four bishops, and he's getting more shots connected here. One after another, as he starts to chunk down Malganis even further. So bishops... Well done. Gets put to sleep though, so he has to be careful, but they're going for another kill and he gets it again. Here at the front line, they're really struggling here. Bishops with one hit. I mean, honestly, Bishops is just absolutely crushing them. 14,000 damage by him this early in the game already. His Hanzo plays are just nasty. The team, of course, makes it possible. They generate a lot of space that he can now use to make these plays, but it leads to an object. Well, it leads to a fort destroy with the first objective and just look at the lead in experience that they have here they're gonna get level 10 in another second and that will allow them to be even more aggressive in one of the other lanes five kills to zero playing a big part in this of course here comes the arrow again <laughs> has a chance to lock another one in here i suppose has by now four stacks by the way on the level one so they are nearly done with the quest as you can see here and they're going for the ult already. In this case, they actually went for the consumed souls. So, uh, Brightwing in trouble. Another hit connected and Captain Rex got nearly murdered by him. Bishops is completing his quest. He's done. Five minutes into the game, completing his level one. Getting a hit on everyone here. There's the arrow, connects it with two. They want to go for the kill and they get it. Six kills to zero. Heroic abilities are making it possible. They want another fort, and why wouldn't they get one? There's still some XP missing for the cats before they can get their heroic abilities, and they're already starting to suffer down here at the bottom. The only hope is to take the minions down as quickly as they can and force the bang bush back. They might be able to hold it for now, but Lauber, he can still bunker up, and he does exactly that. Johan is dead again. Lauber pushes away. And while the fort is still there and hasn't been destroyed yet, Swam Grotta is literally diving behind them, connecting another drag and helping the team to get even more pressure against them. But Hanzo is down. So at least Maitrai was able to get a kill and they're getting a second one too. So now that they have heroic abilities, they are finally in a position where they can play. And it seems like Team Bangbush is a bit too aggressive. Spray game is on point, but that's two kills and will be three kills against the red team. Yeah, a bit more damage against Brightwing, but of course, eventually he's going to fall. Svam Grotta is doing what he can to piss them off, but there it is. Finally, a kill against the Haka. In this case, it doesn't matter too much that they have now a staggered death, because he still has a global that he can use to join the fight at the top. Heroic abilities are popping back up again as well. We got three against seven kills now. Damage output 23,000 <laughs> for Hanzo. Now, Mephisto, to be fair, is also a 20k. So it's not, not too, too bad. But yeah. There's, I guess, a chance for the cats to bring this back. Now, they are very close in experience. It's really the structural damage that's a problem for them. But they can still make a play here. So it's going to be a five versus five once the Dehaka. 
moves in too. Yeah, he has a consumed soul again. Gives him a little bit of vision. And of course, they also get the extra damage in. Which is very quickly negated. But yeah, the Haka is still in the middle. They got their level 13, so that gives them a lead once again. Also the virulent reaction, which is of course for control even better. Triple connect again. They go for Drakia and he gets out as the jet propulsion barely misses him. The bunker after we have the entomb. Leo is low, but he gets out at the same time though. We have a stun on Johan and he is dead. Malganes gets crushed and they take control once again. Pushing them back slowly here. Three kills, a 2 8. And this is still all happening with the level 13 talent advantage that's finally negated by the cats. That, on the other hand, yeah, that's not gonna work. <laughs> Swam Grotta realizes he's like, alright, 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 I guess I'm out of here. He does a surprising amount of damage to Mitra, though, but he won't be able to 1v2 them. This is not gonna be a thing. So as annoying as he can be against them, he is not going to win that fight. So he has to give up on the camp. At the same time, the fort at the bot lane has been destroyed by him and his efforts pushing the minions through. And all of a sudden, at the top lane, it could well be the end of the final fort. Yeah, that's it. No, maybe? Nah, Captain Rex barely alive. Hanzo is dead. My try also down, so that's a kill for a kill on the damage dealers. And a good Entomb that cuts them off a little bit. But I don't really think that it's going to help them too much here. That fort at the top lane is going to fall either way. Skog pausing the game and immediately unpausing. So apparently a little bit of a problem for them. Not quite sure if there's an issue with bishops or what exactly the situation is. Oftentimes it's just as easy as a voice problem that they have to check something out on Discord. Yeah, talking about a Discord, obviously, if you guys are currently watching this and you want to join the Discord channel, you can just simply check out the description and have a look there. The link is ready, not only for the tournament, but also for a lot of the other stuff that we're doing with Meta Madness and with X Cups for additional details. As it stands here at our qualifier, Bang Bush against the Cats, it is looking a bit grim for the blue team. Now, they're not too far behind, it's the level difference. But they're losing one fort after another, and the structural damage is starting to ramp up here. With the third fort destroyed, that means that every single lane is now being pushed by catapults. So that's not really too good. And, well, they could lose even more heroes right now. As it stands, they might even save that. No, I don't think they can save that fort. I guess we're gonna guess. There it is again. So, once more, disabled. But Blaze isn't here, so they save it for now. I love how that Punisher just doesn't stop, by the way. Just like, da, 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 hit after hit. But yeah, this one is obviously going to fall. It's, it's going to be a matter. Uh, again, they are not going to lose it right now. But whenever the Haka really wants it, he's going to get it. So it's just a matter of time. Already, my try getting attacked down here. Jumps on the wave. There's, I mean, textbook. Absolute textbook. They're coming in for the kill. The arrow connects with Brightwing even. So they're trying to get them. Melganus is attempting to help him out. It's... Wow. <laughs> that they got away. <laughs> that was neat. That was actually real sexy. We're going to take another look at that in a second. But it seems like the red team hasn't given up on the kill yet. And instead of... Oh my god. No. It was so well played earlier. And now they're still losing two heroes. They're losing three. Brightwing gets away. Barely. But yeah, let's take another look at this. Here comes the arrow on Brightwing. So that was in the middle of the escape already. My try with the isolation gets hit, jumps back out, and then gets saved by Brightwing as the blink heal is used to reposition her too. So that was actually sexy as hell. But at the end of the day, still three of their heroes died. And they are taking damage in the middle. There's a two-level advantage now for the Bang Bush. They're taking one camp after another, literally painting the map red. But, yeah, still, some cool plays, all in all. But at, if you still aren't able, you know, to do anything with it. Fort, by the way, has now, as expected, been taken down by Dehaka. So they already delivered that. Another camp that he could potentially take here. And I guess they're gonna maybe even... No, Johanna is able to get out. But they can push through the bottom of the map if they want to. They can maybe steal another camp away. Depends all on how aggressive they want to be since now it's 16 for the cats of course too so yeah my try they're trying to be a little bit aggressive there i guess but he doesn't get too much damage in level 20 would of course be a game changer for some of the heroes that we're seeing for the cats especially leo with his entomb upgrade into the buried alive 
could make a big difference. But with the level advantage, now the arrow connects with two, connects with three. One down, two down. Mitra just saved himself with this level 16. So, yeah, he had the will of the Forsaken, but that's three kills. They're losing Junkrat, Bright, Bing, Silvat. They're losing the entire team. Five man team wipe. Everybody taken off the map. Easy kills here, and this will be a key. And then they can go for the objective at the bot lane. I'm not sure if they're gonna go for game. It's 20 seconds. Honestly, they might have the damage. They should have the damage. That might just be enough for them. They're close, and yes, they're, they're risking it. They're coming in. They're trying to take the core down. It's 10 seconds. I'm not sure if they can take the entire thing, but they should be able to at least do a little bit of damage, but I don't think they can finish the job. Or can they? I mean, some damage, yes, but take the team down? Eh, I'm not so sure about that. At 76% now, they get a bit more than that. Leo is already coming in with the Entomb, as you would expect. But Lauber can also bunker up. No, he can't. He's actually in cooldown on this one. All right, still in cooldown. A little bit of slap place by Stukov as he comes in with the big ones. But the fight continues, and now they're isolating Mephisto. The arrow gets hit again. And honestly, Mitra is really paying attention to this. This is the second time that he dodged out on the stun with the Will of the Forsaken. And it saved his life for some time. If he's still able to survive this, that's a different question because the bunker is his demise at the end. The mace to the face. Blaze is dead too. Dehaka, by the way, as all of this happens, doesn't even give a shit about the team fight anymore. He already moved into the mid lane and decided that it's time to take another keep down. So we have big fights happening all over the place. Henning still on the run. The upgrade for the consumed souls. Consumed by hatred. We got the bullseye. And here comes the entomb once again. Leo, he can't handle it. He's down, but they get the kill against Stukov too. Bishop still not giving up on this. And still, while all of this happens, Dehaka is delivering a second keep. Dehaka in the middle. He doesn't care about all of this. He just says, boys, all your bases belong to us. Comes in, takes the keep down. Well done by him. And that is now all of a sudden... I mean, it's an opportunity to get a Punisher, yes. <laughs> but at the same time, gotta deal with Dehaka, right? And he's now in the middle. Might have gone a little bit too deep. Another arrow! <laughs> what an arrow play again! <laughs> Bishops is, I mean, honestly, Bishops on uh, Hanzo is just nasty. It's just disgusting. Yeah, he died a couple more times this, uh, this game, but they get the kill. Sylvanas is dead, Malganus is dead, and I guess we're gonna go for core. While Leo is getting chased, let's have another look at this one. Look at the arrow. Look at that arrow. Look at the minimap. Bam! In the choke point, baiting them into it. Dehaka, of course, with a great play here too. Leo is dead. They're on their way to victory. What a performance again by the Bang Bush. They definitely want to qualify in this tournament. We want to make sure that they get their ticket for the Masters Clash. And they're doing a fantastic job so far. Well done. They lock in a victory on Infernal Shrines. 24 kills, 2-7 as the core falls and the Bang Bush locks in another W at this event. Infernal Shrines, we got another map coming up here. It is the Cats against No Time to Int. And yep, we have another match coming up right now. And it should be kind of wild. So looking forward to this one. Interesting game for sure. But yeah, let's see what exactly they can do right now. This is also, by the way, bullshit because we're having actually Team Kayak play right now. I'm not quite sure I didn't save that. But yeah, today, again, a bit of a confusing day. We switched the tournament system, apparently, from one qualifier to the other. So now we have best of one matches, not best of twos anymore. And if I'm not mistaken, this is actually the last round. So in total, we had like seven rounds or so. And yeah, we had a lot of games coming up here today and jump between the groups. So we'll figure out tomorrow which teams were able to solidify their position in a group and move on to day number two. But yeah, there's a lot that has happened here. And right now with Team Rage Quit, they're obviously fighting pretty hard to get into the Masters Clash. I mean, it's a big event and it's also an offline event. So that's a bonus for a lot of players. And, you know, just want to join up, meet up with others and yeah, just celebrate heroes a bit. Doesn't really hurt that the main tournament has a prize pool of 12,000 uh, euros as well. But right now we got Team Rage Quit against Team Kayak on Infernal Shrines. Jojo is banned. 
Now, interestingly enough, there is nothing really targeting Limu too hard yet. So we have a Sylvanas ban, granted, but his Tracer is still up, his Genji is still available. So a lot of the heroes that we normally see from him are still up for grabs, could even go for a uh, Vala composition. Link is logging in Orega for his team here in Inferno. All right, and there comes Hanzo and Lucio. Double Overwatch. I mean, if it literally starts like that, then you already know what you're in for. So they go for the full OP, OP power. Rega isn't a bad start either, though. You have a lot of camps on the map, five in total, so uh, that helps. And also on the objective is quite helpful. Just the lightning shield. Diablo for the front line and together with that we get Falstad. Okay, so we already got the birdie here. So now you can try and play the global a bit. You can try and uh, execute that on the side lanes, especially around the first objective when you're trying to hit level 7. That's quite neat. Unless, of course, we're going to get that Dehaka for Team Rage Quit. That's one of the things where you have to decide do we really want to ban that or how do we deal with it. And it's even more so important because with Leo banned and with Blaze banned, if you now ban the Haka out, then you're really starting to limit the side lane pool. We have still Urel up, obvious. I mean, there's a couple of heroes they can still take, so it's not like you're running out of side laners anytime soon. But they leave the Haka open, so there's a chance now for Team Rage Quit to get the Haka and then counteract Falstead a bit when he tries to get the extra experience for them. Tychus, always strong with his ult on this map, more so against Diablo when you go for the bigger they are. Uh, so there it is. And with a double pick, the side lane question has to be answered right now. Do you want to go for the global here? I would assume it's one of the strongest. They go for Tyrael first. Alright, they take Tracer. I mean, again, Tracer from Limu is not a shock. I was expecting that to be banned right at the beginning, and it hasn't really happened. So I highlighted, hey, they didn't ban Genji, they didn't ban Tracer. There's the Tracer pick. But not going for a side laner is actually interesting. They prioritized Tyrael over it. I don't think that would have been taken away, so I'm a bit curious to see what they have in mind for their side lane. Because now you can go Dehaka, the and there's even Imperius being played. So that's a very strong front line that's also giving them even more CC. What is Down for Life going to go for? Did they maybe think that if the Haka is taken away, they simply go for Imperius? If that was the thought process, then yeah, they can kiss that goodbye. Space Goat is still up. Could go for that. Mouth Ale. Eh. Not so much. But Urel is still a good pick here, if you want to. So, let's see what we're going to get from Team Rage. It's Diva. Oh my god. Four Overwatch heroes here. Damn. Could have just gone into May and make it a thing. But yeah, Team Overwatch against Team Kayak. Let's go, boys and girls. Infernal Shrines is the map. Team Rage Quit against Team Kayak. She's a kid for the blue team with Tyrael. No game, no life on Hanzo. Diva, <laughs> she's uh, the bomb. Played by Down for Life. We got Limo and Tracer. And Alex Batman on Lucio. Tyrael, he's the ugly duckling of the combo because he's literally the only non Overwatch hero in the mix. We got Master Chips for Team Kayak on the Haka. Torjan on Diablo. Pepe hands on Imperius. Very, very heavy frontline here. Three melees with Link on Rega and J Hart is playing Falstead. So, yeah, it depends a lot on how Tracer in particular is going to play this out. One, two punch on level one for her. Limo obviously loves to play his Tracer and he has to show once again that he is worthy of all that trust that they have for him. So we'll see if they can get those kills, especially against the bird. Frontline might be a little bit harder for him to take apart, but of course they're relying on a few more heroes in this mix. Diva can control the space nicely. I mean, if you're going for the explosion straight on the objective, they can always play around that a little bit. There's of course some displacement options that they have on the side of Team Kayak that they could play around with. But already they're moving in for Imperius and that nearly was a kill against Pepe Hands. So that wasn't too bad. And Tracer wants it and Tracer gets it. Limu zips in, gets the kill. Torjan was trying to cut a path of retreat over. That didn't work. But that was a very, very nasty move against Imperius and he didn't, definitely didn't expect that. So a good kill for Team Rage Quit, opening the game up with the first kill and trying to go for kill number two 
But in this case, at least, didn't quite work out. Rhaegar running straight into the mech here. But gets a bit of a support. Everybody's all of a sudden jumping for D.Va. She's here to play. And, yeah. First kill is in. Not really a lot of a bigger lead yet, but keep the double global in mind. So not only do we have the triple front line, but we also have two globals. And that honestly can become a problem in the mid and the late game because if you play that well, you have a lot of side lane pressure against your opponent's team. And on top of that, you can also of course try and establish that bit of experience as a lead that helps you to lock in a talent maybe a bit quicker. Gives you an advantage over an objective, especially important around level 7 when the first objective is up. But yeah. Level 4 talents available on both sides now. Nothing insane happening here, honestly. Uh, but they're still playing around that camp. And it seems like Team Rage Quit is going to get this one. So yeah, two camps out of the three. Falstead still active in the middle as they're pressuring this even further. And now uh, down at the bottom here. Yeah, still a Tracer looking for an engage. Nice done combo. Nicely done. Limu, is he gonna get away? Yes, but barely. And he gets the connect on Link. And that drops Rega. So that was actually well done. Rega thought he could get a kill there. That wasn't quite the case. This is the second kill, but I feel this is gonna be the end of no game, no life. <laughs> yeah, able to jump out, but still. That's the first kill for Team Kayak. The objective is up though. And for D.Va, yeah, let's see what kind of impact you can have here now. They're starting to take the early lead, but the wave clear is not really there. So it's not like they have an insane amount of wave clear that they can use to quickly establish a lead on the shrine minions. They're pulling ahead slowly but steadily, but it's still going to be a little bit harder for them. The objective is not the only thing that's really important here. We also have the camp that can, of course, be taken. And this Team Kayak is the only team that takes that. So with the Haka now pushing the top lane out, there's honestly a chance that not only do they get the earlier level 7, but maybe even pressure against the fort. Limo was trying to take Tracer down, and they're putting her into a bit of a pickle, but they cannot get the kill there yet. Still good damage on both side lane. Uh, oh, sorry, on both damage dealers. Falstad has taken a bit of a beating. But they are still with 35 points way ahead, and they're going to get this one. Not going to be a problem for them. So up at the top, yeah, the Shaman camp still has to be taken out. But they got the Frozen Punisher and cannot push through the middle. The bait over the wall, as usual, easily executed, easier to defend. And the bird flying in too. Tracer? Limo is honestly towing a very thin line here time and time again, but he is still able to keep himself alive. So they are pressuring. They get the wall. They get some damage on the fort. But not much more than that. So, well, either way, for an opening, wasn't too bad for the blue team. And they're also trying to look for another kill. I mean, Lucio alone is just speeding things up so quickly. So they can move from one lane to another insanely fast. And here have Tracer with the added mobility and also Hanzo. This is a very annoying lineup but they go for Hanzo again and he just hasn't half the mobility to get that far away there's of course a lot of things that he can pull off but with Diablo just following his every step time and time again it's a bit too tricky that's the second kill now against Hanzo so both of them died same time now we're having a move in for the camp but Diablo is already low they gotta be very careful with this Diva is by the way pushing top so she's getting damage in at the wall. I'm not sure if that camp is really worth it. She has a lot of freedom to work with. The Haka is finally moving in as Diva is rotating back down. But the plays are continuing. And we're getting closer and closer to level 10 abilities now. It's an interesting game. It's a bit all over the place. The team fight so far dominated by Team Rage Quit. But Hanzo overstepping quite a few times and paying the price for it. Whereas D.Va and the Haka are locked in in that battle between mid and top lane. There is still that double, that double global that concerns me a bit. And if played correctly, Team Kaya could very heavily rely on those two to run the late game. I mean, we haven't seen a fort fall yet. But level 10 abilities are now available for both teams. We get the bunny hop. Mm, yeah, ancestral bunny hop. Safety on Tyrael with the Angelic Armaments too. Only Hanzo hasn't made a choice yet. I mean, technically, he could go into the Meme Strike. 
But Arrow is just great. If he can get a stun against, for example, Falstead, whew, Tracer could easily jump on him and take him down. But if you're going for the bunny hop and you're already doing that, that could also help you to control them a little bit further. I mean, either way, we'll see how they're going to play it. For now, it's just top line pressure that they're attempting to execute again. Of course, with this triple frontline, as already talked about a bit earlier, you have a lot of hit points assembled at the front that make it very hard to just simply jump in and get, take a quick kill. There's a lot of CC involved here too, with the Haka's Tong, with Imperius, Lunge, Diablo with a wall stun and on top of that of course also the apocalypse that he can now utilize. Falstad at the side lane exactly where he's supposed to be. Escorting that camp in and trying to get another tower destroyed successfully I might add. And up at the top right even more attacks. There's the meme strike. They went for it. Meme strike and they're yoloing it out. And yeah. Not a lot of value out of this one. Ancestral is out. There's a sanctification. That fight doesn't make any sense to me, by the way. I don't understand why they fight here. I really don't get it. It was a 4 to four versus 4 in the first place. There was no talent advantage. The objective was already up. If all of this would have been executed over here, I mean, totally get it. But why at the fort? What were they really hoping to accomplish? Were they thinking they could get a kill that easily? They dropped two big ults now, two big cooldowns. Tracer dies. Team Kayak has a big opportunity to change the momentum in the game. And they're going even for another kill as they are homing in on Hanzo. That's the third time that he dies. The Gust, yeah, that didn't really work for them. But again, they have no full control of this and they're going to grab it for sure. It's a little bit of work that Master Chips on this Dehaka has to do in the middle of the map. We have 15,000 damage from Imperius. Top damage is still Hanzo. Uh, blue team is now starting to steal a few of the camps away. It's the only thing that he really can do. But yeah, top side, there's the Arcane Punisher. Not sure if that's going to get them an entire fort. It depends a bit on if they want to defend. But at this point, it looks more like Team Rage Quit is trying to double pressure in the middle and the bot lane. And try to trade. So that can happen. Yeah, they could go for that trade. Especially here in the middle. And Falsa needs to be very careful too. If he gets jumped. Hanzo. Hanzo is not having a good day. Hanzo died four times now. I mean, it's five kills against the blue team. And if you are four of them, uh, this is not something where you're like, all right, this is going to go great, guys. Yeah, this is not a proud moment. But here comes another bait over the wall. They're trying to defend here. Of course, as they are coming in from the side and angle. The attempt at CC is there. The Globals are instantly sitting in the middle of the bot lane. The explosion's already out. They're trying to play in. The Haka should probably Global up if they want to help them out. But there's another kill. Lucio is dead. I mean, Overwatch is turning into overrated if this continues. Six kills to four and things are not looking too peachy for Team Rage Quit. They started off well with a kill in the early game, but now they're really struggling to get a single one on the board and they're already more than a level behind. Here comes the Haka, another one, Hanzo. He came, he saw, and he died again. Veni, Vidi, BG. I mean, <laughs> at this point, it's even, I mean, honestly, even minions are more dangerous than Hanzo right now, and they're harder to kill too. So uh, they are going for one after another, and it seems like this might even be the end of the first keep of the game. Especially since now with a few more minions, they could also accomplish level 16 talents very quickly. But Ancestral had to be used. We got a little bit more pressure here. Halfway down the keep. That's not too bad either. Falstad might have to cover the retreat with a good gust. And well, there's level 16. They could force that fight. There's the meme strike. Okay, it at least isolates Diablo this time a little bit. So that's good. Material died too, so they're trading tanks. The explosion still connects. Objective up in the middle, or soon. But that's level 16 advantage for them. They're level ahead, and they can use that now to push this even further. So it's a bit of a wild game, honestly. Team Rage Quit is getting farmed, and that's particularly true for Hanzo. But yeah, either way, talking about Hanzo. Hanzo at this point decided he's just going to play PvE. PvE. He's like, boys, I got a PhD in PvE and I am gonna use it. Screw this PvP shit. I'm tired of that. It's not going well for me either. 
So yeah, there's the explosion again. Okay, good high five from Lucio, saving Tracer, but they're taking control of the bot lane camp. And they can take this one too. And up at the top, the Haka. Yeah, I mean, again, you should be able to get out of this one. Don't really see him dying to this. Pops the Essence too. Now that Lucio joins the fun, that might change things a little bit, but nah, not really. The Haka waddles his way out of it, or so I thought. And Hanzo dies again at the bot lane. What else is new? <laughs> I mean, at this point, it's just a meme. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't want to be mean here, but he is having a very, very bad game. Shit happens. Don't get me wrong. It happens to the best of us, but he, this is a game where he's just going to be like, Oh God, can we please, please? We need this to end one way or another. But they're trading structures. So the bottom fort and the top fort have now both been eliminated. And they are pushing this further as they are starting to attack another keep and get even more damage in. So yeah, there's that. Uh, is that a kill? That is indeed a kill. No ancestral. Seems like Link was just sitting there like, yeah, not for you. Sorry, bro. It's too, it's, uh, it's like too important. Yeah, jumps out. Is he self-ancestraling? Yeah. Baiting out. The old over here, by the way, Diablo, he's dying. Tracer still tries to get a kill and might be able to pull it off. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Limu, uh, careful, my friend. That could be a bite. If you overdo it, you might all of a sudden find yourself on the menu. But yeah, they go a bit too deep and all of a sudden Rhaegar, after he kept himself alive for this long, dies too. Sanctification is out and that's another kill. So... Uh, the game continues to be wild. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> the four dies, gets obliterated, and now we all of a sudden have eight kills to ten. Just when you thought that Team Kayak was absolutely dominating this, it turns out that the push to the bot lane was too aggressive and they lost way too many heroes here. Yeah, and ults too. That's even this, that's the next problem. They lost a lot of their heroic abilities as well. So yeah, Sanctification was used in that fight and helped them to encounter this more. By the way, it was Imperius that died there. Both of them are pretty much interchangeable, honestly. If you're talking about two heroes that have the exact same personality in this game, I think Tyrael and Imperius is the perfect example. Both of them are a little bit stuck up. They got literally just like uh, stick up their ass and they're just like always striding across the battlefield. They could be the perfect bureaucrats. If you're trying, like I want to see if there's two heroes in the game where I say like, okay, these guys are definitely German. It's Imperius and it is Serial. No sense of humor, not funny, and just totally stick up their ass. Fully following the rules and everything. I can totally picture them in an office, you know, and just bullying people all day long. That's the type of person that they are and you all know it as well. So over here though, 19 versus 19 and they are pushing this hard now with the objective and they're going to get the first keep of the game. So the keep is gone, can they get more? That's a bigger question. But yeah, 8 kills to 10. By the way, while the keep falls, it seems like it's going to be a trade because this one is not looking too good either and the catapult should be able to take this down. I don't think they can hearth back in time. Well, maybe, I didn't even realize Diva was already there. Yeah, she saves it. She saves the day for them. Good, or it would have been just an easy trade. Now, the party continues. Level 20, any second now for both of them. But, yep, this gives us the Contagion. Ancestral, I mean, mainly upgrades here. Holy Arena is in. We're also getting uh, the Heavenly Host. I mean... Yeah, cooldown reduction obviously for Hansa now, so all of a sudden that level 10 ability finally becomes an ult. And, well, can we get a bit more there? At least they got the camps, right? Yeah, but I mean, think about it. I, the talent names alone. Look at the talent names. Justice Fall. Bound by law. I mean, the Germans, they want their talent names back. Swift Retribution, the Sword of Justice, the Burning Halo. I mean, if you're talking about, like, stuck up, that's pretty much the definition. And then on the other side, you got the burn the impure, battle hunger, holy fervor, heat of the battle and the melting touch. I mean, a little bit different. So it feels like if they're brothers, then he's like the bad boy of the family. But you can definitely tell that they're related, 100%. Now, they are invading everything right now. <laughs> Again, they're like the Germans. They're coming in, trying to take the camp away. But there's a sanctification. That's a big cooldown to burn for a camp. But then again, that's not the only one. For Hanzo, it's not that big of a deal because he gets the cooldown reduction. But Limu pays the price. 
And that's a problem. That's a 60 second cooldown before he's back to business. And they are diving even underneath the fort in an attempt to get even more kills. And that's a double connect on the apocalypse. Can they go for Jerry? No! But the kill! Hanzo, the triple kill! Team Kayak! Damn, son! Team Kayak is getting crushed and they are struggling. And they're struggling a lot now. 11 kills to 11. And of course, with four heroes on the map, you gotta now decide what you wanna do with this. Team Rage quit. They're gonna start to move in for the bottom keep, as it seems. They can't go for the core. They don't have the damage here. And one of their main damage healers is also missing. So they can't even go for additional hero kills. But they should have the time to get a lead on the shrine. And they're opening up the wall at the bot lane. Because the next shrine is spawning bot side. So if you take the Punisher, that's an opportunity to go for keep and core. So, well, there we go. We have another camp about to be taken, so they're going for that. Meme Strike is back, and the Holy Arena will be back as well. Damage output, Imperius is top damage right now for Team Kayak. 79,000 for Hanzo. He died six times, but he also entered for a reason, I guess. Trading, you know, your life for damage. Tracer then again, she's at 65,000. And there's the Meme Strike already. You can YOLO that shit out time and time again with a cooldown reduction now. That's not really a problem. 50 seconds, and you bet your ass he's gonna have another one as this continues, unless he insta dies. But he has just simply wait. Look at it, there it is again. Already has it ready. It's just insane. Can YOLO it out once more? Does exactly that. Big damage this time, potentially zones them away. Explosion on D.Va, but the Gust denies it. Hanzo trying to get more of a cooldown reduction too as he connects one hit after another. The fight rage is on and Team Kayak is starting to drop in hit points and they're dropping quickly. Hanzo has the third ult in the same battle and misses it completely. <laughs> I mean, not even close. That one was way too far off. The Punisher is taken by the blue team but the fight isn't over yet. They're trying to get a kill. Tracer recalls, she still dies. Hanzo gets another ult if he wants it, but three heroes are already down. Yeah, gets the hit in on Falstead at least. And I suppose we're looking at a five-man wipe in the end of the game. Team Rage Quit. They're raging a lot here towards the late game, but I don't think they're quitting anytime soon. They're moving in for the W on Infernal Shrines. Team Kayak, now they got taken down here. 16 kills to 12 and oh boy, that was nasty. So yeah, here we go. B Punisher obviously is toying with the keep at the bottom, but the team is already going for the core. And that's a victory. We got 28 kills in total. A successful win for Team Rage Quit. Played all our well for them. And they defeat Team Kayak on Infernal Shrines. GG. Masters Clash Qualifier number three, everybody. We have Sky Temple, and it is the only map today. So we are still in our group stage. As I already explained in the past, we have on the first day of each qualifier, on Saturdays, we have a bit of a group stage, group stage system that the Masters Clash guys are playing here. And then on the second day, the best teams out of the group stage advance to a bracket system and play out the remainders of the qualifiers. A team that wins a qualifier automatically qualifies for the Masters Clash, for the play playoffs in total we have 12,000 euros of prize money uh, the interesting thing is though that they changed the format a little bit so previously we played our best of twos between the teams and then depending on how many maps you won you gain points for the standings now it's a little bit different they actually are now playing only best of ones so I'm going to repeat that probably quite a bit today because it's quite the change. And I'm a little bit surprised by it, to be quite frank with you. In the middle of a qualifier system to simply change it like that is something I didn't expect. So uh, we're going to jump from game to game today. But we have a round robin system in the group stage now where the teams are playing a single map against each other. In this case, that means we have Inting for Ruby in against Team Copium. But we have a fair amount of really interesting teams signing up today. Now, last week already, we had the Bang Bush, which is Lauber's team. They are playing. It's pretty much an all-sweets team. And we have a second one that also signed up. And this is the first qualifier that they're playing. And that is Granite Gaming. Granite Gaming is playing with Breeze, Wubi, with Smexy and Poik. So we're going to take a closer look at them later on today, too. 
But as we're heading into Sky Temple, our first map of the day, we have a Blaze. Early pick on him. The bans on Brightwing with a Junkrat ban also my F. Which means that the Globals are still up. So you could play the Haka, you could play a False Set if you want to later on. And try and dominate the rotation, especially towards the second objective a little bit. Keep in mind that with the boss being very crucial towards the later stages of the game, we oftentimes see a focus on it too. And Hat is going for Vala with an early Rhaegar pick. So it looks like we're gonna likely see a double support Rhaegar. And I like it. Yeah, this could actually be interesting. This could be a little bit wild. Inting for Rubia has always been a team, you know, that is willing to sometimes throw out a bit of YOLO. And this, uh, I mean, on the execution side, they're not always absolutely on point, but they always try to play these strategies against teams that are a little bit about their skill level, which makes it really difficult to execute them properly too. So if they can play it out today or not, that's a different question, but we'll figure it out sooner rather than later. Corbium is a pretty strong team. We haven't covered them too much in the past few qualifiers, but they were really fighting tooth and nail to make it into the second phase of the qualifier. So far they failed twice, but to my knowledge she just barely didn't make it. So now we have Johanna and Blaze as a tag team towards the front, and with Lucio you have also guaranteed quick rotation between the lanes, which can definitely catch a team off guard if they don't constantly pay attention. Azaria is banned. I really think that's a good ban. With Vala already taken and Rega, you might not necessarily go for double support, but instead drop Zarya here. Falstad banned out as well. So if you go for that side laner, then this is an opportunity to pick up the Haka, play him, and yeah, run him then as a global on the map. But you obviously could also just go into a Ural or whatever towards the top side. Question that still remains is double support, yes or no? And well, it's immediately answered. And they are playing a similar strategy to what they played recently, if you remember. They go for that Chen. So it's a bit of a... It's a bit of a variation of the McDonald's strategy of Fnatic in the good old days. But obviously, back then, things were different. Tower still had ammunition. Uh, the buildings that you took down still gave a lot more experience. You could really snowball hard with a particular strategy. But it can still be very, very annoying. And it allows for a very, very strong four-man. I think the last time they played it, they played it with the Vikings too. So we could actually see that again. Uh, don't have to, obviously, but it was the variation they played. And there they do it again. Vikings get played. Sky Temple, the only map in uh, this best of one. They're up against Hanzo and against Sylvanas. And well, with that, we're heading straight into the map. So, guys, let's get ready. Vikings and a double support Vala on Sky Temple for Indic for Ruby. Yeah, game on! We're heading straight into our first map of the day. It is Team Copium against Inting for Ruby on the left side. We got Mind Talk on Stukov, Nox on Rega, the double support for the blue team with Galnegunla trying to control the experience on the side lanes. Fish on Chen and Hat on Vala. Yeah, an homage to the old Fnatic strategy that even won them. Uh, Big event, they were able to win a mid-season brawl with that strategy. Won a crucial map in a best of seven against Dignitas with it. Now on the right side of the map, Team Copium with Alfredo and Silvana, Marlon, Johanna. Nano plays Hanzo, we got Guilty Spark on Lucio and Pachnox on Blaze. And immediately with the Vikings already moving out, we have to move towards the bot lane. Not staying here too long. Keep in mind, Tad is all going to go for the order attacks here and is going to try to play those out. I went last time already heavily over what exactly the McDonald's strategy is. A Fnatic coined that back then because they were looking for a strategy in a scrim that allowed them to very quickly win a game. It was pretty much a do or die strategy. Either they would lose very quickly or they would win very quickly. The background was that they wanted to go to a McDonald's and grab food and the McDonald's was about to close. And then they came up with pretty much that combo here. We already have Sylvanas down falling victim to it. And the first time they played it was also on this very map on Sky Temple. But as I already alluded to in the draft, a few things have changed since then. The McDonald's strategy that Fnatic played had a similar thought process behind it. But the idea was always to barrel through that bottom of the map very quickly, take the fort down. And then with a the lead on level 10, go for the boss and end the game right then and there. And they executed that perfectly. But these days it's not quite possible anymore to do it the same way. Because towers and forts don't give the same amount of experience anymore. You can't take that instant instantaneous massive lead and experience that would allow you then to grab level 10 and go for the boss play but it can still be very annoying and we already have 26 stacks right now on Vala 
with her level 1. Gambit obviously still intact, so hasn't died a single time just yet. Instead, they got a kill on Sylvanas. And Sylvanas against the Vikings is always quite nice as well. Ooh, um, hat, hello, <laughs> team. If he is there already, that would have been quite the disaster. That's not something that you can afford to do if you are banking all of your DPS or most of your DPS on Vala. So yeah, they need to keep him alive. Same is also true for Fish, but the focus is too much for Chen. The panda goes down, Death Dealer is out. But of course, they're trying to get into the late game here. Now, all the way up towards the top, we already have Pachnox taking the entire wall down. So Blaze is definitely frying those two Vikings here. And it makes it difficult for Galnagulnar to hold on to the structures. And it seems like the same is now happening down at the bottom of the map. The strategy definitely, yeah, starting to show some weaknesses for sure. Well played by Team Copium. And again, we have seen way more games from ending for Ruby in the past, and I haven't really focused as much on Team Copium, but we definitely have to give them a bit of a shout out there. Now, we of course had some of their games. Alfredo over here on his Sylvanas. We've seen him a few times. But here come those plays again. Fish wants to try and sneak the next objective, which is the Siege Giants for them. But they need the heals, and they're not getting them. The Panda's gonna die again. Panda goes down, and they delay the Siege Giants. Try still to claim them. Mitor comes in with a big slap and takes down Lucio, but he falls victim to Sylvanas shortly after. Obviously, if they can still stay in experience range, then the late game could prove to be quite successful for them with Vala not dying yet. But we gotta be honest here, both of the temples seem to be going over to Team Copium and they're not only pulling ahead in experience and therefore adding an extra talent, but they're getting way ahead in structures and that is the real problem right now. Gift of the Ox for our boy, for Chen, for the Panda. And yeah, they are trying to at least get some counter pressure at the bottom of the map. But they lost the fort at the top and they're losing a lot of hit points in the fort in the middle. And this is looking more and more like we might even see two of the forts fall just as the game starts. The experience gap is going to widen as all of this continues. They have to at least get some value down here. If they don't do that, then this is going to be a nightmare. Now, Galnagulnar steals at least a few of the shots away. But with Sylvanas and Blaze jumping in the middle, there's no doubt what's going to happen to this fort. So they have to at least take this one down down here. But it seems like even that might become a problem. The first quest reward for Vala, so good for her. Obviously, once she gets level 16, things are getting a little bit better for her. Because she's going to get all of that extra damage. And if you can maintain all of that attack speed, then you find yourself in a really good position to dish out the pain. But as things stand, they're losing ground very quickly. They're definitely looking towards the late game with this, because early game is not working for them. At least not well. So right now, Vala is stacking as best she can. They need to keep Hat alive. They are hoping to also take some structures down, at least so that Catapults will spawn for them too. If they can pull it off or not, that's a very, very different question right now. Giving you a bit of an idea of the damage output here. We currently have 12,000 for Vala only, but again, it's all about the later stages of the game right now. It's just time to stack. And Fish is eating a lot of damage here. But he's still keeping himself alive. So good for them. He died twice already. As we were going for Siege Chance earlier. And they still got a pretty decent amount of experience. So they haven't fallen behind too much yet in XP. And that's one of the most crucial parts here. So... Yep. And well, with that, we now have up at the top. Marlo doing his thing already. Okay... Mm and here we go. Inting for Ruby. They are finally able to take down one at the bot lane. We got, by the way, also Bloodlust this time. Could even try to go for a play here. Arrow is in action and so is Sylvanas. We have a double arrow. Hans and Sylvanas could go full tag team on them if they unleash the pain. Boss is, of course, up too. And there's the big question. When exactly are we going to see Inting for Ruby make a bit of the stand and determine that it's now time to shine? Hans is just poking the damage out over and over and over again. Whereas Vala is looking for the next quest reward. Hasn't gotten it yet. 
And as I explain, yeah, and they go for the boss. Now they make that play, but there is a big difference between them going for it and what we've seen Fnatic do in the past. They don't have a big talent advantage at level 10, but they have at least the keg. So if they can keg it up a little bit, there's the arrow, the big one. Vikings are falling and they're not the only one. The panda is dead before K can keg it. There's the slaps. Everybody dead or dying. And that's a total disaster for inting for Ruby. They are getting decimated here. That did not work out well for them. Big arrow straight onto the boss, as you can see. And before the panda could cake, we had also, of course, the arrow from Sylvanas, for the, the stun from Johanna. There was just way too much that shut them down. Stuns and silences, and that dropped them very, very quickly. Yeah, plays like this is always a bit of a double-edged sword. Either you win the battle and then you are able to pull a bit ahead, but if you're losing it this decisively, then uh, you're obviously falling farther and farther behind. The silver lining, I suppose, is that they didn't lose Vala, so Vala did not lose any of her Gambit stacks. But if that's gonna help them, that is a... V yeah, that's a different question. I mean... It might already be too little too late. They're now trailing behind by more than a level. They got absolutely murdered in that last fight. And had he needs to get that damage out. They need to somehow get Vala into a position where they can do that. They Eating that arrow from Hanzo as nearly entire team was a big problem. Now Vala gets attacked. Another arrow soaked up by Stukov. So good for them. At least they're surviving for now. But for how long? That's the question. Stukov is dead. And it seems like the rest of the team is also finding themselves in trouble. In particular, Fish is really low. And he gets murdered by Hanzo. The arrow connects. Even more poke happening. Nox and Hat, they survive. But the push continues. And it seems that Alfredo and his boys are now aiming for the key itself structures are falling all over the place for the blue team and it is a nightmare they're closing on level 13 talents but with the sh i mean we, we are still looking at the second objective phase yes most of the shots have been taken but they just destroyed a keep we're eight and a half minutes into the game and they just destroyed a keep that that's how bad this is right now for them and i don't know how, how they could recover here one and a half levels behind I mean, it's wild. They are in a really, really tough spot. They need some kills. They need them quickly. The question is just how do they get them? If they had level 16, then I would at least believe a little bit into in the power of Vala. As mentioned, once she has Manticore, the attack speed through the Gambit stacks is a huge difference. But they're not there yet. So how are they going to play around it? I honestly don't know. And Team Copium, they don't have to take this fight. You don't have to win every single battle. They're half a level away from level 16, so it's actually the smart move for the red team to simply let this one slide and not attack here. Yes, they might have won the fight and put the final nail into the coffin, but why risk it? If you lose the battle, you give your opponent an out and a chance to get back into the game, so they don't give them that opportunity, and instead they're waiting for level 16, they're waiting for the talent advantage, and then they can make the play. And that should really help them there. Now the boss is also up in another two minutes, so let's keep that in mind too. Could even play around that if you wanted to. By now with level 16. Nice power spikes for them as well. Yeah, and it's time to soak some experience. Get the camp. Get some XP. Try for Manticore. Avoid fights and only take the ones that you really have to take. The problem is that there's a Sylvanas on the other side. And that allows Team Copium to push for structures whenever they want. And that's exactly what they're doing. It's exactly what they should do. Use Sylvanas as best they can. Now we have a double temple coming up as well. And there's still an entire level to soak for the blue team. Now we got Galnikulna in the mid lane with Olaf. Ass crack Olaf uh, is in action here. And, well, I was expecting them maybe to rotate one of them down to the bottom of the map, but that hasn't happened yet either. Once they take the temple, you know what that means. This fort or this keep is going to fall. The fountain doesn't soak any shots anymore. The wall is gone, so the keep is going to fall. Now they at least took some of the camps and can maybe get some extra damage down at the bottom of the map, but they need experience. They need level 16, and once they have level 16, they need to force fights. It's the only thing that they can do. Only thing that's uh, possible for them to be pulled off here. <laughs> oh boy, two keeps down. 11 minutes into the game. 
It's all on Vala now. And she doesn't even have the second quest reward on her level 1 yet. So, they don't even have that. Keep is gone. They haven't tried to get this with the Vikings yet either. They are looking for a bit more experience as Mindhog is now moving in. And there it is. Vala is Manticore and we got the Largen in charge. So that makes the Vikings also a lot more dangerous in these team fights. But a boss is up again. Is anybody making a play here? Now, the blue team might as well YOLO. They might as well YOLO on the boss and say like, fuck it, let's go. Try and dodge Hanzo's arrow and then make the play here. It's pretty much the only thing that they can do. But it seems like the red team isn't checking. There we go. No, what? Alright, alright. They are checking. They will be checking. But they might be a little bit too late. They, yeah, they are a little bit too late. Not a lot, but a little bit at least. And this time the boss is taken. Easily at that, I might add. Uh, if they can get a bit more, that would be great. So, as I said, they have to really push it now. They have to do some work here. Catapults are being taken out, or at least one of them. That's already important. Top lane is, of course, a bit of a problem, but there's only one catapult here. And at the bottom of the map, they have to do some real work now. They know that they are on a timer. They're still more than a level behind, and they have to really put the pain in. Hanzo doesn't have his arrow anymore. That's one of the stuns gone. Sylvanas just chunking out the damage here against the Vikings as they're starting to move back in trying to take a keep down too that would help them to open up an opportunity at the bot lane but the boss gets murdered absolutely murdered Hanzo doing well here and so does the rest of the team Sylvanas are of course just crushing this and they have to find an opening they're looking for it too but it is a little bit tricky uh, Hat he gets his stacks together slowly but steadily has strafe out too keeps him a little bit at bay but that didn't really do a lot of damage for them now, they already used Bloodlust. It's going to be back in 20 seconds. They used a lot to get that boss. But the damage was minimal. So they are still alive. They haven't gotten a kill. Vala is getting a bit further ahead. And it's a bush trap. Yeah. Guilty Spark is slowly moving in here. They see with the Vikings what's happening. They're baiting. They're baiting. But it doesn't look like Al Nagulna is a master baiter. I mean, he's a medium beta at best because nobody's following him. They don't care. <laughs> Instead, they're just going for the top shots. Attacking the keep in the middle. And they're taking the camp now too. But the blue team, they use that chance to go down to the bottom of the map to take the keep down. The problem is that the red team is likely going to go for the core now. But, well, depends on Hanzo. Can he interrupt the hearth? Oh, it's a race. It's a race, baby! They go for the race! They're trying to end it! And here's the blind from Johanna! The arrow connects as well. Oh boy, they are in trouble. The blinds of Jojo. The core is falling on both sides. Who does it quicker? Over here, this is pretty much gone. Vala is down on the right side of the map. The core is at 56%. They're all gonna die here. Everybody move back. They're taking all of them down. 46%, 244. They made it a bit more exciting towards the end than I thought possible. But it looks like this is a win for Team Copium. In this first match of the day, we have Team Copium locking in a victory on Sky Temple against Inting for Ruby. GG. <laughs> well done. Good job by the team in red.